I started flying when I was in, let's see, 60s, I was a freshman in high school. You know, my dad belonged to a glider club, and he got me kind of hooked into that. And for gliders, you only need to be 14 to solo. So when I was 14, I started flying lessons. And then by 1969, I had my license, you know, for glider. And flew gliders up until about 1989, I think was the last logbook entry there. And then had about a 15, 20 year hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kids, life, everything else, you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, flying's not cheap. So, you know, that went by the wayside for a while. And then when we moved down to Cumberland, the guy that lived across the street from us was a pilot and he got me involved in the Experimental Aircraft Association. And they were wanting to get back into building. They were a spinoff from another chapter that had kind of gone gone through the building phase. Now they were just social, so they didn't, there really wasn't hardly anybody building anything anymore. And two of the guys from that chapter started 1121, the chapter I'm in, just to get the building operations going back again. So they'd been looking around, they found a design that really didn't require a whole lot of special tools. You know, it could be basically done with hand tools, with the exception of a few parts. And one of the two guys was a machinist, and he had the access to the high-end equipment for forms and things like that. But uh, they bought enough material to build five airplanes. It was a, a Zenith 601 HD. And the other fellow that started the chapter, he was a part supplier for Indy cars. So he had access to material, aircraft quality material, at a lot cheaper than he can buy it in most places, and he could buy it in bulk. So the amount of material we bought to build five airplanes only totaled about 3,000 bucks. Where if you went and bought the kit, the kit at the time was about 14,000. Now, there are a lot of parts that are already bent, and sh you know, a lot of bending and cutting's already been done, but, you know, Dollars wise, I mean, it was, you know, what, seven to one, something like that. It was a lot higher cost. So that's how it got started. But anyway, out of that group, they built, or they had five sets of partners. And of the five original plans that were started, two of them got completed that I know of. Uh, one guy had moved, left the area. I don't know if he ever finished it. Uh, two other guys had sold their projects and who knows where they went. But our plane and, and Alan Gluff were the only ones out of the five that were completed. But percentage wise, when we got our airworthiness certificate, the FAA told us it's welcome to the 3% club. And it's like, what's that? I says, well, 3% of airplanes that start out as projects get completed. Yeah. So I was like, in that case, we beat the odds in that chapter because we had a 40% completion rate compared <laughs> to three, so. <laughs> you know, so so there's all. the Zenith, so how long did you have that then? See, we got that one complete. We started on it in 1995, got the airworthiness for it in 2009. You know, so we spent, the guts of 14 years building it. Yeah, you know, but we were working one night a week, four hours or so, you know, and everything was from scratch. So you had to cut eight by, or four by 12 sheets of aluminum into all the parts you needed. So to be honest, for the first six or seven years, we were just making a kit, you know, so you saw this pile of cut aluminum, but you didn't really see any real progress as far as an airplane. And uh, there you go, there's a PT-23. It's, it's a World War II trainer. You know, laboring into the wind. Yeah, well, the wind's apparently a little stronger than it looks. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, it ended up just working on it consistently. Out of 52 weeks in a year, we probably worked on it 48 to 50. So it wasn't like we had a whole lot of time any, at any one point. 
but just kept continuously, consistently working on it. Yeah, you know, we got the airworthiness for it in 2009, and we flew it for, see, when did we sell it? 2014, so we flew it for five years, you know, and in that five years, it had 625 hours on it. And uh, in the meantime, I was looking for another project, and I was just looking through barnstormers and found a guy that had an O200 for sale that was rebuilt, and the airplane came with it. <laughs> yeah, so I bought the engine for 8000 The airplane, which was nothing but, a, at that stage, really a basket case, you know, it had been disassembled because the uh, second owner had wrecked it. And the guys I bought it from is a father and son. They were both structural engineers, but they really were aircraft builders. And the repair work they did, I mean, structurally it was sound, but aesthetically it was, they weren't the quality of builder that the original builder <laughs> of this airplane was. You know, any of the areas that you look on this airplane that the original builder did it, you can shoot a line down all the rivets. Well, the guys that did the repair, I mean, like I said, it's structurally sound. I'm not concerned about it from a safety standpoint, but rivets don't line up and, you know, spacing's not exact. You know, little, little things like that that walking by, you wouldn't necessarily notice it. But if you start looking close, you realize that those rivets are kind of wandering and, <laughs> you know, craftsmanship wasn't quite their forte. But uh, the sun, they were in... At the time, they started off in Minneapolis, and then the son got another job down in Mankato, which is about 125 miles away, and he took the project with him because he was doing most of the actual physical work on it. And then at that point, he had two kids. He had two more in quick succession, so fairly fast. He had four kids all under the age of seven, so he no longer had the time money or inclination to work on it <laughs> and a 255 or 250 mile round trip for the dad's like okay that's it we're selling it you know so I picked it up and well actually I bought it in November of 13 13 no November of 14 but it took them another three months to get the paperwork sorted out because when I asked them about it I'd looked up the end number on the FAA database and it showed up as uh, destroyed. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. Like a salvage title, basically? As, as in the aircraft had been destroyed. And it had been damaged in a wreck, but you know, like it wasn't destroyed by any stretch. And they went through a very long paperwork battle with Oklahoma City and the FAA and it turned out what had actually happened, the guy that bought the plane, the second owner who would wrecked it, he had also wrecked the Cherokee earlier that had the end number on it that this plane had when I bought it. And what he had done, he'd filed a paperwork with the FAA, told him 21 Frank Mike, which was the number that was on this airplane when I bought it, which came from the Cherokee, which was wrecked, he wanted that end number put on this airplane, declare the old Cherokee destroyed, and then apply that number to this one. Well, it turned out the FAA screwed it up, and they, they took the end number, put it on this airplane, but then listed it as destroyed, not the Cherokee. <laughs> so you got all that paperwork hassle taken care of. So, you know, that was kind of the hold up on picking it up because yeah, you know, I didn't want to buy it if it didn't have a clear title to it. So, yeah. you know, so, so that took another three months. So I picked it up in February of 15, rented a Penske truck. And a friend of mine, Chris Harvin, we drove up to get it. It was 25 below zero, 30 mile an hour wind. Mm. And the good thing was the guy, he had it in a garage. It had a wood burner, a stove in it. So I was like, in the garage, it wasn't so bad but taking the pieces out and putting them into the truck in that wind was absolutely bitter. <laughs> so anyway, we finally got the thing loaded up and driving back home. And it was just 
the weekend we went up there to get it, we did it primarily because there was a bad storm moving and we're trying to get there and back before it hit. Well, we kind of got caught in the middle of it on the way back. And the number of cars that we saw that were down at the bottom of the slope on the interstate or down in the median or stuff like that, and the wind was howling. And we had a 29-foot box van. And this airplane only weighs about 760 pounds. So it's like, as far as the truck was concerned, it was essentially empty. And I was having all kind of fun trying to keep that truck <laughs> on the road in a lane because it kept wanting to rock the truck over, you know. So I was so glad to get home. <laughs> we got back here. We parked the truck here in front of the hangar about 2.30 in the morning. You know, when we got back, so I was like, put out a, I can't remember if it was an email or, might have been a text, but anyway, didn't expect anybody to respond, but you know, Chris and I were out here to unload the truck the next day, and I had about 18 people out here to help. <laughs> and I was like, it's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of nice that, you know, the grapevine worked that fast and had that kind of help. You know, it was nice to see that kind of support, but it was actually too much because you couldn't get more than about three or four people in that truck without stepping on each <laughs> other. So we ended up doing the, the bucket brigade, you know, just passing parts out of the back of it and stacking them in the hangar. But uh, spent the next almost two years before I got the thing back to flying again. And a lot of that was protracted by the guy I made the unfortunate mistake of picking for a painter. You know, because for some reason, aircraft painters have this, ha or have this reputation for taking a really long time. And we had a guy here in, in local that was, does really good work, but he was notorious for taking a year, year and a half to get an airplane painted. And it's like, you know, I'd gone to this guy who was a body guy, you know, and he was all eager to do it. And I told him right up front, he's like, I don't want this to take any more than a three months tops. And he's like, oh, no problem. So I took the fuselage in, or took the wings in first, and he had them done within a week. And they really looked nice. You know, it's like, okay, this actually might go somewhere. So we take the wings back to the hangar, bring the fuselage down, and it sat there for the next nine months. So I could have been flying nine months earlier than I had if I'd picked somebody else. You're you not know. bitter, though. Uh, not, uh, <laughs> not bitter. I mean, he did a good job, but the, it just took him forever. It was like when it, I brought the wings down, it was something new. <laughs> had his interest up. As soon as he got past that stage, it was like, eh, it's not really interesting anymore, you know. So it took a long, long time to get it out of there. So, but... I think the first flight was in May of 2017, somewhere around in there, April, May. I'd have to go look at the log book, but yeah, I was roughly in that time frame. But uh, I had a bunch of time in that Zenith. You know, I had about 600 hours in it, but I've never flown one of these. So I was like, there's a Davis Builders group on the internet, and I got a, I just basically put up on the bulletin board if, if there's anybody there that would be interested in, you know, just flying with me for a couple hours just so I had an idea how the thing felt. You know, because the idea of jumping into an airplane with having no idea what its handling characteristics are or anything like that, it's like that's kind of a death wish situation. So I was like, and there's a guy out in St. Louis Mike Wilson, he said, yeah, come on down. You know, so we drove over there. It was a Memorial Day weekend. I do remember that. So we spent the weekend over in St. Louis. And uh, his was based at Creve Coeur, which is kind of on the northwest side of St. Louis. And that airport, if, if you just want to go out and take a look, just visit that airport. It is full of really nice antiques. And... There's a Lockheed Lodestar there that's polished up. You know, it's just a mirror. You know, and there's a whole bunch of antiques like that. They're in phenomenally good condition. You know, I mean, planes that you open the cowling and it's clean enough to eat off of. <laughs> but uh, 
we flew for probably two and a half, three hours. I got a couple of dozen takeoffs and landings in it and found out that it actually flew pretty much like the 601 did, except that it was just a little bit, all the numbers were a little bit faster. But as far as the way it handled, the way it felt, it's pretty much the same. You know, so at the end of that, I tried to fill his tank up and he wouldn't let me do it. You know, I was like, <laughs> kind of a typical EAA attitude, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll help somebody else out, but no, this is no problem. I got no problem doing it. You know, I like, <laughs> <laughs> and I've run, a, I've run across that in a lot of different EAA groups or anybody that belongs to EAA. You know, they're more than willing to bend over backwards to help somebody and they ain't looking for a dime, you know, so. Getting one winding up. <laughs> yeah. So where all have you taken this then? What's the longest uh, trip you've done in this? Because you did the Michigan one in the 601, right? Yeah, we did a, just before Deirdre got married, we, you know, did a flight around Lake Michigan with, we were <laughs> airplane number 13 because nobody wanted the number. <laughs> and uh, there's actually 14 airplanes on that trip. But it was a, a three day trip. We took off from Indianapolis and then the first stop was in uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, which they're pretty well known for cranes. But what I didn't realize is they were actually the major manufacturer for U.S. submarines in World War II. You know, I was like, I would have expected that to be something that was done on the East Coast or the West Coast, but, you know, Lake Michigan? Yeah, but turned out they've, they've produced something like 75, 80% of the U.S submarine fleet and depending on which theater it went to if it went to the atlantic theater they went out the st lawrence seaway but if it was going to the pacific they'd go down to chicago up the chicago river and it hooks up with a canal system that takes it over to the mississippi and then out the mississippi and through the panama canal i never knew until then that you could actually get to the mississippi from lake michigan yeah, you know, I actually ended up Google Earthing that and following it. By God, there is one there. It's just like, I just never knew it existed. You know, and then the second night, we were at St. Ignace, which is basically just the Upper Peninsula mainland portion from uh, uh, Mackinac Island. You know, so overnighted there and then coming back the next day, you know, back, back to Indianapolis. But, uh, Coming back that morning, the 601 only cruised at about 90, 95, somewhere around in there. And when we took off, the airport in St. Ignace is right next to the Mackinac Bridge. Sunrise, because we took off early to beat the weather that was forecast to come into that area, took off and it's like, and ground speed's awfully slow. You know, I wasn't really paying attention. We're flying along the Mackinac Bridge. I told Deirdre, get the camera, get a picture. He says, I can't. He says, why not? It's out in the baggage compartments, out in the wing. <laughs> so that was a picture, once in a lifetime shot, and it went down the tube. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, on, the way, on that trip, we were just flying just high enough to, you know, where it wasn't bumpy. You know, so we're only, I don't know, thousand feet above the ground or something like that but once we finally got to the point where it wasn't bumpy like that and air had settled down I'm looking at my airspeed I'm showing 95 but I'm looking at my ground speed and I'm showing 40. It took us <laughs> five hours to get from St. Ignace, Michigan to Benton Harbor which is only about 250 miles. <laughs> and it took so long because of the wind I actually had to stop at uh, Holland, Michigan to refuel. I didn't, ha I didn't have enough gas to get to <laughs> Benton Harbor, which was a scheduled fuel stop. But, uh, you know, five hours to get to Benton Harbor, and I'm thinking, geez, Benton Harbor's only halfway home. So I'm thinking, God, I really don't want five or another five hours of flying to get home. When we left Benton Harbor, South Bend's airspace is fairly close to there so what we ended up doing was climbing up higher to go over the top of it instead of having to mess with South Bend approach <laughs> just to go home. We found out when you got to about 6,000 feet the wind changed about 90 degrees and all of a sudden that 
50 mile an hour headwind I'd had all day became a 40 mile an hour tailwind. <laughs> so we actually ended up getting back from Benton Harbor in Indianapolis in under two hours. <laughs> and it was the same distance it took us five hours to cover. <laughs> yeah, but that was a fun trip. I mean, what's your, what is your favorite thing about this plane? Anywhere you go with it, you know, like do a lot of, you know, like go Columbus has a restaurant on the field. They call it the $100 hamburger routine. But essentially, whenever you go someplace and you park the airplane, you come back and there's going to be people standing around trying to figure out, what the hell is it? <laughs> you know, when people ask me, I'd kind of jokingly tell them it's the freeze-dried bonanza because <laughs> it's, it's a V-tailed airplane like a bonanza, but it's half the size and it looks like you ran it through a trash compactor because <laughs> you know, everything on it's pretty square and angular but uh it, it definitely gets attention whenever you know wherever you go because it is a, a rare airplane you know it's a 1964 home built design that was a scratch built you know because back in 64 they didn't make kits and uh supposedly there was like 300 and some sets of plans sold and i'd seen figures saying that there's like 80 of them flying but i doubt that significantly because if you look in the FAA database, there's only about 12 of them show up. And of those 12, there's only about five or six that are airworthy. I do know of three of them in Canada, and two of them are at the same airport. <laughs> uh, they're, and they're, they're all up in uh, Montreal. Or not Montreal, uh, Quebec. And uh, so it is a rare airplane. There's one in England. You know, and I'd actually, there's a guy named Peter Barker. I've actually had emails back and forth with him. But uh, very few people even know what it is because it is, it's in the aviation world, especially for experimental aviation, it is definitely a rare airplane. You know, it's, you very rarely see one. And so far flying the thing, I've only had one guy correctly identify it. I take it back, two guys correctly identify it. And in both cases, it was up going up to Oshkosh. When I flew it to Oshkosh the first time, the, uh, the guy that was marshalling me in to park it and I, you know, shut it down and got out, and he says, that's a really nice looking Davis DA-2. And he says, well, I'll congratulate you because you're the first guy that's ever I correctly identified it. And then after the week, I flew home. I usually, I try to burn car gas in it because it's a lot cheaper and the engine's low compression. It, it can handle it no problem. And it's a lot cheaper than nav gas. And uh, Hartford, Wisconsin is one of the airports on the way up I usually stop at because they have mo gas on the field. And I'd flown into there and pulled up the pump. And this guy on a little mini bike comes up and he goes, Hey, nice Davis. You want to see mine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back over to his hangar and he had one too you know it's like okay that's, that's you know the only one that i was aware of that was flying was mike wilson's out in illinois and he was up at oshkosh with it too you know so i was like i didn't even realize there was another one around this guy wasn't in the the davis group you know i don't know if he just never looked it up or wasn't inclined to but you know he wasn't on the radar you know for the the davis builders group and it's like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, I mean, up at Oshkosh, I mean, there's a lot of comments because it, it is, I'll have to admit, I, I do think it's a nice looking one. You know, it's got an unusual paint job on it. But the biggest comments I was getting when they looked inside and they saw that it was all an all glass panel. You know, so it's kind of an oxymoron because it's, it's an airplane that was a 1960s design and here it is with a 21st century panel in it. You know, it's like <laughs> it's got two axis autopilot and all the stuff that's supposed to have on it now. And there's one fellow that has a new Leon Davis, the guy that designed it. And he goes, man, Leon wouldn't believe what's in, inside this one. 